80% of dudes rapping, they ain't nice as me 98% ain't live the same type of life as me The judge gave me life and then they sent me where the life is be That level forward depth and vice, the type of stuff they like to see Two choices, fight or flee, I refuse to die a chump I've never been a mark, but damn it's scary when that riot jump I've seen dudes cry, get pumped, or some sexually brutalized I knew a dude who lost his life and he was only doing five Year long racial fights when homie all you do is ride Lonely days and nights have been a whole cause in suicide From the moment you arrive, you see the Mexican Mafia AB skinheads with big giant swastikas Pro-black philosophers, the BGF, the Kumi And Muslims who will murk you from the nation to the Sunni That MS was loony, quick to ride up on they rival Even Christians went to church, hide knives up in a Bible Political and tribal, the Crips and Damus The Long Beast, the Hubs and the Dubs and the Grooves The IE, the Bakersfield the day go pie rules the hustlers quick to roll the gangsters don't move whatever click you choose you better... say what's cracking youtube it's your boy 16 to life and i'm back like i'm on a pro violation yard down now today we got an extremely special guest going on we got the brother damian porter um he has a prison channel it's called damian porter prison prison chronicles i definitely want you guys to go check that out like and subscribe we got some good videos um, he just recently came home from doing nine years, and uh, he started his YouTube channel. So tell us a little about yourself, Damien. Well, uh, hello, everyone. And like Chill said, uh, check out my YouTube channel, Damien Porter Prison Chronicles. And there I explain some of my life, uh, how my criminal activity began which was at the age of 14 years old. And I started off and I went to camp at the age of 14. And then from camp, I did a year in camp, got out when I was 15, ended up going to CYA for four years, got out from CYA when I was 19. And all of this was for robberies. Uh, and from CYA, I went to prison. Uh, First a level three, first a level two prison in Avenal, then I went to Corcoran level three in 95, then Lancaster in 96, and then I graduated to the level four prisons in 1999, having caught another robbery. Uh, now, now, excuse me real quick, Damien, before we get too, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let the folks know where you're from, where you grew up at, and, and things like that. Okay, uh, well, uh, I, I grew up in, in Watts, and in South Central, uh, and of course, both of them are uh, very extremely dangerous situations, uh, gang-infested, drug-infested neighborhoods, and this, of course, uh, contributed to uh, my life of crime. So let me ask you now, you said you, so originally you grew up in Watts. So how old were you before you moved to, um, to South Central? 12. And so um, growing up in Watts, I'm sure by the age of 12, you had become well aware of the gang presence and stuff like that. What, what area was you staying in? I was staying on like 102nd and uh, Central, I guess would be the first, uh, the best way to describe it, or 103rd and Central. Right across the street from Will Rogers Park, now known as Ted Watkins Park, in a, a place called the Franklin Squares. Uh, and they built the homes over there in 1978. Everyone that's over there, or that was over there at that time, they all moved, we all moved in at the same time in 1978. And we ended up losing our home in 1986. A lot of people who moved into the homes in 1978, they're still there. Uh, but of course, some people lost their homes as well. We were one of the first ones to lose our home. Uh, my mother was a single parent, taking care of all the children and uh, a struggle ensued, a financial struggle ensued. And uh, we ended up losing the home. And at that point, we moved to 110th in Vermont, uh, in South Central. And I stayed there for some time, and then we moved to Culver City. And so my childhood was, after the age of 12, just full of me moving from place to place and trying to get stabilized. 
And so let me ask you this, you know, I, I believe, you know, because I have a lot of viewers a little bit everywhere. So we want to inform them that the Franklin Square, that's a predominantly crip, uh, crip populated area, right? Yes. So had you had you become introduced to Crippen or or had you started Crippen before before you moved? Yes. Uh, but as I said, I moved at 12 years old. So, right. you know. So while what's, while you was what sort of game banging can you really do at the age of twelve? You know? Right, you may have been introduced to it, but you wasn't you wasn't an official member. But it do you was influenced by the culture of, of Crippen. Yes. Right, and then so at what age do you believe that that you know the saying goes that you hopped off in the porch and you really started getting into the gang banging type stuff and uh, you know out there running the streets? Uh, well, I would say that would probably be at 13 uh -huh. uh, at the age of 13 uh, really once we had moved and i think that uh, looking back on it i became upset a little bit unruly and felt insecure and unstable with my living situation and my family situation at that juncture and i began to act out and i was shot with a 12 gauge shotgun uh close range i still have over 400 pellets according to the doctor that testified in my trial in my left leg uh, two of the pellets have traveled to my heart over the years they're sitting there right now uh and that i took that gunshot wound when i was 12 and i was nine days away from being 13 years old uh so and then after that happened i really became even more unruly and didn't care and began to run the streets even more. And then at 14, as I said, is when I began to get caught for my criminal activity and began to have to pay for it. Right. Now, Damien, let me, incarceration. let me let me ask you, you had, you had mentioned that um, your mother was a single mother. How many brothers and sisters did you have? And where do you fall on that totem pole? Are you the oldest? Are you the youngest? Where did you fit in? Uh, well, I have two sisters and one brother and i have a sister a big sister who is three years older than me so i'll be 50 in february she'll be 53 in march and then my brother is 10 years younger than me and my little sister is 11 years younger than me so it's my big sister than me and then my two youngest they, they're one year apart 10 years 11 years younger than me Right. And then so you you mentioned something that was extremely interesting, man. And I have to ask you a little bit about this and um, feel comfortable to discuss as much or as little as you are comfortable in discussing, though. How did you get shot at the age of 12 years old with a uh, with a shotgun? Well, uh, as everyone will see when they subscribe to my channel, I'm an open book and I don't really hide anything so i feel free about discussing the entire situation really but just to paraphrase it or to summer or to summarize what happened uh, uh i was in a park right there at real rogers park uh, that i was speaking about in watts and with a few of my my childhood friends and we were playing with some dude that had passed by and i was 12 years old we were all in that age group and we were like calling him names or something, telling him to get out of here, get out of the park. And he left, a black dude, he left. And a few minutes later, we were leaving. And then I saw him coming back. I, I recognized him as being the same guy. I saw him coming back, he had a trench coat on mm. with a hat on. And I didn't, I didn't recognize either that attire at first, but then when I saw him again, he had the trench coat on. And so, he ran up on me and i just threw my hands up because i couldn't even get away at that point my homeboy that was with me he ran he was able to get away and he came out of his trench coat with the shotgun and was right I was, he was right right there on me right just had it right there on me i mean I, I, two inches away and i think perhaps he recognized at that juncture that i was a young person that i was 12 years old uh with I don't know how he thought I was, but he could say, see that I was a, a bit younger. 
and maybe decided then to spare me or spare my life. I don't know, but he wasn't trying to spare me too much because he ended up shooting me in my left upper thigh. I think perhaps he was aiming for my private parts. That's what I always thought, and that the gun kicked when he shot it, and it just moved over because it just barely missed it. It just moved over just a little bit and hit me right there in the upper thigh. Wow, that's that's extremely interesting, man. And if you don't mind, I got I got a few questions on that. But uh, first question I have: How old do you how old do you believe he he was? Uh, I would say I would say he was uh, in his thirties. Wow, mid, wow. Mid, mid to late mid to late thirties. Right, because I'm sitting here. I'm trying to I'm trying to I'm trying to think about and figure out. What possibly could could have been going through the mind of a grown man to come back and shoot a shoot a child? You know, you are definitely a pretty big brother, man. But I mean, even at the age of twelve, I'm I'm assuming he had to re recognize, like you said, that you were um you were younger. And so, um, this area is a heavily populated gang area, or sometimes maybe depending on where you was, I'm not I, I'm not sure. I'm just I'm just uh, assuming. But my question was, when you guys was harassing the dude or messing with him or playing what with, with him. Was there any gang-related conversation or gang-related jargon no. being passed? No, not not no no whatsoever. Uh, I never thought that we never thought that he was a gang member. He didn't give it any of that sort of vibe whatsoever. So it had nothing to do with gangs. He didn't know where we were from. I didn't know where he was from, and just childish fun out there, huh? Just like sometimes yeah. people just messing with people, just having fun. <clears throat> exactly and wow and we were just children and, and basically horse playing with him and uh, uh, apparently he took umbrage to that and wouldn't retrieve the weapon unbeknownst to any of us and we were just leaving the park at that time and as i said he ran up on i just happened to be the one that was closest to him hmm. from where he was running to or running from and that's how I ended up catching and getting caught right there. Right. And so when he when he whipped out the gauge in that split second before he shot you, did you did you did you believe he was gonna be shot? Did you think he was just trying to scare you? What was if you can remember what was going through your mind? Well, at that time, only thing that was going through my mind was that uh, I need to survive this, whatever happens. Uh, and I was just hoping that. He didn't shoot me in the chest or in the head because I knew that that uh, my chances of survival would be minimal. Even at that age, uh, I had digest digested that truth. So I was just hoping that basically that he did what he ended up doing, which is shoot me so in the leg. I was hoping that he didn't shoot me at all, of course. But if he did, I was just hoping that I would survive it. I was uh, he had it, the gun on me just for a second. So I was hoping to, I only had a split second to hope that he didn't follow through, but it was just a second. I mean, he put it on me a second later, he pulled the trigger. Wow. That's, that's, that's crazy, man. Imagine it being shot at 12 years old with a, with a, with a, you know, with a, with a shotgun at that. And so once you realize you're shot, what do you do? Well, and did, excuse me and, oh and that's what i was going to ask you did the gun did the gun knock you down or what happened after he shot you well it almost knocked me down it it, it, it uh blew me back some carried me back a couple feet just a sure and sheer power of the blast wow of a, of a 12 gauge and i was a big dude but i was still 12 right uh and so but i didn't fall to the ground at that point fell back some and I began to run uh, if you want to call it a run real slow I just felt a real hot heat in my left leg just like as if it was burning as if it was on fire and I remember looking down to see if it was on fire it just felt like it was on fire but I was just those pellets on the inside just eating me up and I ran about a half a block and I couldn't run anymore because my leg was just giving out on me. So I stopped right there, and I sat down and began to hope that he didn't come back mm. uh, because I couldn't even move anymore. 
but I figured that the people that I was with were going to retrieve a weapon or something of their own and, and coming right back. So I figured uh, if he comes back, he better do it now. Uh, and so the ambulance came, didn't take too long because I was there with my friends and they had saw what happened or they knew what happened. So they automatically ran and called 911 when they took off running and heard the, and heard the gunshot. They heard the blast. And so they took off and they, so they, the ambulance didn't take too long, thankfully. And I think that that helped to save me because I lost a lot of blood. Wow. And so I, I know that had to be being being shot at the age of, of 12 years old. I know that had to be an extremely fe fearful situation. Right. And so I'm I'm assuming some of my some of my viewers are are thinking, why did why didn't being shot deter you from later on getting further involved into the streets and eventually in, in, in gangs and stuff? Well, uh, for the same reason that people who go to prison, they return to prison after being paroled, or people who use drugs, they use them more than once and don't stop when they use the drugs one time, even though they know that the drugs are a detriment to their body. Uh, it's just the environment, essentially, uh, here in the ghettos, grottos, and catacombs of America that we end up growing up in and the culture that we adapt to and adopt uh, oftentimes dictates that your criminal activity, it continues in your younger, in your younger years. And so uh, even though I, I got shot, the same circumstances that led me to be hanging out in the park at night, getting shot were still there after I got shot, those same circumstances were still there. I was still living in poverty. I still didn't have a father in the home. I still didn't have any proper direction. And so getting shot only exacerbated these shortcomings. And so instead of uh, them turning me around, they aggravated, the, the gunshot aggravated me and put me into the streets deeper. And you know what? I think that's a great point that you just made, Damien. And that's extremely profound because you have a lot of people who don't live in these communities that some of us are raised up in. And so they only see the end result after we go to prison or while we're in prison, but they don't understand the circumstances that lead to this. And I think that you pointed that out sometimes, you know, sometimes we don't see better opportunities or we don't have access to opportunities. And so what we see is what's going on in our community. And I just think that was extremely uh an extremely intelligent breakdown that you've done, man. And, and so thank you on that. Um, You're welcome. And so what, so now after you said, eventually you started, you started getting into robberies. How, how did that come about? Well, uh, me and my best friend, uh, I would say it started with him. Uh, I was again in the same age group, about 12, 13 years old and I, I had already began to become familiar with weapons having been shot and growing up and watched uh, again gang infested and weapon infested uh, I was no stranger to a pistol even at the age of 12 or 13 and so uh, I thought that selling drugs was not really something that I wanted to do uh, because uh, just the idea of it had turned me off because of uh, a little drug history in my family. And also, I didn't have the patience to sell drugs, uh, to sit around and wait for days to build money up or wait on my money when I was in need of money right then and there, even at that young age. And so I figured the best way to get money and to get it rapidly would be to rob. And that's what I began to do. Uh, I picked up a, a weapon and I got a friend who was willing to do the same thing with me, to rob people with me. And that's what I began to do. And once I started, it was almost hard to stop because 
for one, I hadn't gotten enough money to stop. It's not like I was robbing banks where I got enough money and I can turn my life around now. When you're when you're out and you're committing committing these criminal acts, these indiscretions, oftentimes they repeat themselves because the one that indiscretion does not suffice. Even if so, if you're selling drugs and you sell ten kilos, that's not enough to to hold you for the rest of your life. And so you have to continue to sell and continue to sell, particularly if you don't take that money and invest it into something legal and grow the money uh, with your mind. Right. And it's the same thing with the robberies. And so uh, for every one robbery that I got caught for, there was 50 that I didn't get caught for. But I, I, I committed another one and committed another one because the money that's coming from them, it's not enough to sustain me forever. It's, it's going to run out at some point. It's not that much money that I'm robbing for. And so now when the money runs out, I'm, I'm out looking for another robbery. And at some point, you can continue to commit the crime. At some point, you're going to get caught. Right. And I think that's, once again, that's something very, very important that you mentioned, you know, that while we're, because I, I used to sell drugs myself. And so while, while we're doing these things, we're young minded. You know, we're not planning for the future. And when you get, when you're making fast money, having a young mentality, we assume that we can always go back. And commit another robbery, sell more drugs, or whatever it is, but not realizing that each time we do that, it increases our chances of getting caught, and it also makes us feel more, more uh, like we can't get caught. Pretty much, basically, you know. So it, it's definitely puts the odds against us. And so, um, what what was your what was your decision? Or did you, did you make a did you make a uh, I guess uh, a specific decision to join the gang or? How did that go about even within your community? Well, particularly back then, you didn't really have a lot of choice. Uh, growing up in, in gang neighborhoods, uh, you know, me, like a lot of youth, the gang sort of became my family. It sort of becomes your family, uh, particularly if you're missing the father, father figure in the home who is not ge gearing you correctly towards manhood, then you look for the game as a sort of manhood, as, as, as your manhood, as your strength, and you be, uh, are influenced by the game in that way, and that you want to be strong and be a man, and you're not being geared in this way in the household, and so you step out into the streets and they're there and they want you, they want to recruit you as it is. And you see them making money or you see them getting respect. And it's attractive to you, particularly at a young age. And so uh, as a black youth, if you don't have the proper guidance to steer you away from that, then you're likely to fall prey. Uh, and that's why it's so important for people like myself and you and other uh, comrades who have been to prison and have been through these sort of situations to reach back out to the youth so that they can circumvent these situations that we fell prey to because it makes absolutely no sense for us to have to do the time and then for our brethren our offspring to grow up and have to do the time as well and you know what once again man I, you know i definitely i'm already enjoying this this um this interview man because you make a lot of good points you know and that's while you're talking i'm i'm sitting back and reflecting my same situation and i don't remember not one of my homies coming home from prison telling me that prison wasn't cool you know we made prison seem like a badge of honor you know the homies would get out back then they would have muscles they'd have long hair you know the women would the women would uh be flocking around them and stuff and so they made prison seem like it was a rite of passage and so um i heard you mention on your page Damien Porter, Prison Chronicles, that you went to jail for a robbery, you got out, and you eventually committed another robbery and went right back to prison. Yes. Uh, I committed another robbery. I continued to commit robberies uh, well into my early 20s. And because, again, I was just on a slippery slope, had not learned my lesson, and had not acquired any other skills 
to acquire any financial gains legally had not taken the time to learn any other skills uh, to acquire any financial means. And so I just, the only thing that I knew how to do at that time was to be a criminal and was to go and rob, uh, as, as sad as that is. And so that's why the recidivism rate is so high then and now with people returning to prison because they too get out and still have uh, no direction and uh, no real plans and no real goals. And the system has gotten a little better now with them trying to rehabilitate people as opposed to just housing us. Uh, but for some time, the CDC system was uh, anything but uh, rehabilitative. And people wonder why people would get out and still commit crimes to go back to prison. Well, it's only because they had not been re rehabilitated and were getting out with absolutely no resources and with an entire society judging them. And they felt like they had no other alternative but to go for what they prior, what they knew prior, which was some form of street life. And uh, that's why you see a lot of athletes retire be beyond their years. They should have retired years ago because they just can't, they just they go back to what they know. Uh, and they don't know what they're going to do after they retire. And it's the same way with a criminal mind and that, once you're on that slippery slope with your criminality, it's hard for you to see and vision something else for you in the future, particularly if you're making money uh, and, and with its criminal element in your life. And so in order to break yourself out of it, you have to first want to break yourself out of it. You have to see the misery and pain that you're causing yourself and your family. And you have to begin to love, love yourself because once you truly love yourself, then you will not want to put yourself through the acrimony and strife of incarceration. Most, most definitely. And so I have never myself, I have never been to CYA, which is for those who may not know, it's California youth authority. And it's pretty much like a prison for uh, young adults and juveniles. And so um, explain a little bit of, of the mindset, you know, when you are in California Youth Authority, um, you know, you're around homies, you're around your, your friends at gang bang, you're around other Crips and Bloods, you're in a, you you basically feel at home. So um, once again, that, 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 um, what's the word I'm looking for? That uh, environment didn't deter you, deter you from, from uh, living that life? Well, no, because, uh, like you made mention of earlier, uh, growing up, we saw YA as as a joke almost. Uh, you know, we would make jokes about YA, and we felt like going to YA or prison uh, was some sort of stripe on your belt that it made you a big homie, it made you a G, and and earned you this sort of respect, and so going to YA, it wasn't a, uh, a deterrent because I still hadn't reached the big time yet. I still hadn't been to prison. Uh, and so I figured getting out of YA, yeah, I may get some respect or whatever, but uh, they, they had not thrown the book at me yet. They had not been super serious with me yet to the point where I was ready to begin to change my life. I was still young when I got out of YA. I was 19 years old. So, you know, I'm still ready to uh, run the streets. Uh, I hadn't learned too much while I was there as far as any sort of direction. And so when I got out, I still had no direction. And once again, I reverted back to what I knew best, uh, the one element in my life that I thought never failed me which was to pick up a weapon and to point it at someone, not understanding at that point in time the damage, psychological and emotional damage that I'm causing someone else when I point a weapon at them. Uh, even though I had one pointed at me in my younger years and fired upon 
uh, it still hadn't registered to me at that young age, the trauma that could potentially be causing someone else with my actions. And when it began to register, it's when I began to change. Now I got a I got, I got a quick question for you, Damien. Um, you wasn't you wasn't a lifer, right? No, I was not a lifer. And, and uh, thankfully, they was trying to give me life, though. They were trying to give me life, but I didn't, I didn't get it. The reason why I asked that question is because I've done a lot of time in prison, 24 years, right? And I can honestly say that a lot of my um, intellectual maturity came through classes that I was forced to take as a by being a lifer. What I noticed about you is you have an extreme amount of insight. You are extremely intelligent. And I'm impressed because... Like you say, you wasn't a lifer, so you wasn't forced to take any of these type of classes. You know, your awareness of, of your lifestyle on how it affects other people is extremely high, especially for a person who wasn't a lifer. Because a lot of people, when you're not a lifer in the California prison system, you don't have to go in front of the board. You, you're you going to get out. Only thing you have to do to get out is stay alive and until the day your date comes. And so many yeah. people, many people sadly don't choose higher education. You know, a lot of people think that because you get older, you get wiser. And that's not true. You know, you have to seek, you have to seek information and education in order to become wise. And I noticed that you've done that. So that's, that's impressive. You know, anytime I would see a person who wasn't a lifer in one of the self-help groups that I was in, to me, it was impressive because I can honestly say I wouldn't have been in the class if I didn't have to take the class in order to seek my freedom. But I heard you say earlier that you you originally went to Avenal. Avenal is a level two. And while Avenal is still a prison, any prison is extremely dangerous. But what's the difference between Avenal and one of these level fours like High Desert? Well, the difference is monumental. Uh, you know, Avenal, you know, of course, the prison system is based on a point system. Uh, the point system determines what level you go to. And the level one, two, three, four, uh, level one being the lowest, level four being the highest. And so level one and two are typically pe people with lower, lower points have lower time one year two years six months even and uh are in there for a somewhat petty crime and so they put them all together in the dorm on a level one and a level two there's, there's not much politics there uh, everyone has a date and their date to go home oftentimes it's very near uh whereas on a level four the vast majority of the people there have life sentences and they don't have a parole date. They're just now giving lifers parole dates and letting some lifers out at this time in the early 2000s and in the 90s, lifers were not going home at all whatsoever. And so they really had nothing to lose. They felt like they had nothing to lose. They were trying to program and still were not yielding anything. Uh, the government wasn't yielding anything to them uh, in terms of their freedom. And a lot of them began to politic very hard, began to turn on the police at this time. And there were a lot of assaults on staff and a lot of hard politics to deal with on the yard, on, on a level four yard, because everyone there was in misery. They was fed up. They were aggressive. They were violent and dangerous because they had life sentences and they were not going home. And this built up trauma and anger oftentimes causes them to lash out on whoever's around. And that's and, and that's 100 percent correct. And basically also the tension at a level two is periodic. It's every now and then something happens. There may be some grouping. It may be some fighting or whatever, some racial uh, politics going on. The tension at a level four is constant. It's daily. It's you almost even when there's nothing going on, it's something going on because, you know, it's just a matter of time um, at a level four. To be honest, you know, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to go back to a level four at this stage in my life. Just knowing knowing the potential of of losing life or taking life at a level four. And so what prison did you get to initially that you realized, OK, this is prison. I'm really I'm really where it's cracking at. 
uh, that would have to be high desert, you know, uh, because I was in Corcoran in 1995, as I stated, and Corcoran was also a violent prison, particularly for it to be a level three. A lot of level threes are not violent. Ones and twos are almost non-violent. Uh, and some level threes, you know, they have a little situations here and there with violence. But for the most part, as long as you do what you need to do, you'll be okay. <clears throat> but with Corcoran and the police setting up fights at this time and betting on the fights and then unaliving the inmates once, once they fight on the fight that they set up and bet on, uh, there's a lot of tension there in, in 1995. Uh, because these fights were transpiring in 1994 for the most part. And I got there in February 1995 in Corcoran. But so I was beginning to see a little bit about prison and what it was about there in Corcoran, but still nothing compares uh, to a level 4 180, absolutely nothing. And I would even venture to say that many level 4s uh, if not all of them do not compare to high desert state prison. I talk about high desert on my page and the violence that uh, besets high desert and the violence is palpable in the air. The air is constantly thick and tense with violence. Every group in high desert state prison, while Pelican Bay is the most famous prison right now, High Desert is the most violent prison. Anybody who's in prison, who's on the level four, uh, they know what who the most violent prison is, what the most violent prison is, that would be High Desert. Uh, and I was up there for seven years in High Desert State Prison, and every group up there, uh, the whites, the blacks, they had Nortenos up there, Serenos and others, all of them used weapons. Uh, there was like a, a, a no fight rule or law on the yard. There were, there were very little fights on the yard. Most incidents involved an assault with a weapon. And uh, most of the assaults with a weapon were very ugly affairs. Uh, none of them were uh, just uh, small acts of violence. All of them were intense. And uh, many people were unalived when I was there in High Desert. And so High Desert, with the hardcore politics that goes on there, is the prison for sure that really showed me what prison is about, uh, about politics and violence. And if, that, if you're not on your P's and Q's, you really could lose your life in this place. Because before I got there, I still had some play in me i still thought maybe prison was a joke having just been on that level two and level three yard i still had to begin to take things serious or take prison serious until i got to high desert and realized that it's very serious and that if you're not careful and cautious and working out and being strong and studying that you can lose your life because you're not alert and you're not paying attention now i have a quick question right because i know that depending on what prison a person may be in, there's always the possibility of guards aiding a certain group of people. I think, I believe it's just human nature. You know, um, some people are going to have a certain affinity for their race and they're going to try to help them as much as possible. You know, I think a lot of times people think that because a person dons on a law enforcement suit, he becomes infallible and he's automatically um, free of, of corruption, and which is not true. So this, I believe this happens at a lot of prisons, but I have often heard that High Desert was extremely racist in terms of the guards aiding the white convicts, giving them knives, uh, uh, things of that nature. Um, in your experience, was that true? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> High Desert <clears throat> is extremely racist. Uh, the most racist prison in California. Uh, the COs there don't even hide the fact that they're racist, they make no bones about it and no apologies for it. Uh, they do assist the whites there in many ways. Uh, I spoke 
on my channel about a riot that we, the blacks, had against the whites in 2002, where the correctional officers there allowed the whites to come to the yard with their weapons while the blacks were unable to get to the yard with their weapons. And so uh, they assist uh, their fellow inmates, their, or, or their uh, white inmates there. And again, they make little effort to hide the fact that they are there to assist them and that they could not care less about our struggles or our plights. Right. And so um, I'm assuming that you've done you've done time in several other prisons outside of high desert. So do you think the the assisting of the, the white convicts by by um, the high desert administration and officials brought brought <laughs> forth more unity among the black prisoners? Because, you know, we know sometimes that or at least I definitely feel this way. I'm pretty sure you feel the same way. There is not enough unity among black prisoners sometimes in these California prisons, you know. Um, did that did that cause a, a tighter collective up there in, in a high desert? It did, and uh, but still not enough, you know, uh, still not enough uh, black unity. We still was not on one accord until an incident happened where we had to get on one accord. And so uh, this is prevalent in many prisons. This is prevalent on the street where uh, black men uh, feel like no one can tell them anything and they uh, appear to have some sort of aversion uh, to any sort of structure or hierarchy and uh, this uh, attitude has contributed uh, to our thousands upon thousands of years of servitude and uh we began to try to come together in high desert because the guys up there were very strong. It was the cream of the crop. Whoever was weak had already got off the yard, had been exposed and been off the yard. So everybody that was on the yard was very strong. Uh, and we stuck together up there a lot. And we tried to form one unit against the opposition, that being the police. And so high desert is really where I did see the bulk of black love and black unity, uh, but it was still lacking in many areas. And so let me ask you, because um, I don't think we mentioned that you had told me earlier, you had done a nine year term and then you came back and done 11 or you done 11, you came back and done nine. So you have done a decent amount of time in prison. Do you feel that the lack of unity among the black prisoners or convicts sometimes definitely plays a role in when there is racial strife with other races and the blacks not being as effective as they could be? Oh, yeah. Uh, that's the biggest role. You know, uh, that's the biggest role that, <clears throat> again, that plagues us <clears throat> in all of our fights and struggles for freedom. Uh, it plagued us uh, in slavery, it played this really before the transatlantic slave trade. It was really disunity and us becoming fractured that enabled the opposition to do what they did and put us in chains and bring us over here. And prison is no different. The disunity uh, just allows us to realize our strength because we're so disunited uh, and that therefore when we get into it with a different group we don't have the same strength and aggressiveness and togetherness that preparation and self-love and unity would bring if we had those things and sometimes it puts us in a position where we are in a weaker position when it comes to these riots and such in prisons because our communication is off and our communication is off because we don't have the proper unity. Right. And I don't believe, I don't believe a person has to be a racist to have <laughs> deep respect and a deep love 
for his people, wanting to see his people win. You know, I, I believe that's almost human nature, you know, for you to to want to see the people who the race that you associate yourself with win. And so I, I heard you mention in one of your one of your videos that. When you heard about the blacks in Pelican Bay and they got the short end of the stick that angered you, that angered a lot of the blacks around you. And so when you guys got into a episode with the whites in high desert, you wanted to basically put down a demonstration that was going to show that we're angry. We're not going for this. And um, how did that affect you guys? Well, yeah, uh, you know, just that, that uh, I believe blacks on level four yards in their entirety were uh, upset at the attack in Pelican Bay and uh, wanted some form of retribution. And I certainly did. And uh, that's certainly what I was pushing for. And so uh, we were really just waiting on an opportunity. And when the whites attacked us there in high desert, and when you consider that the whites were with the Hispanics, when the riot happened in Pelican Bay, that many black people feel like the riot was over the fact that the Southsiders were defending the whites in Pelican Bay. And right. we knew all of this. And so uh, that fueled us more and angered us. And when the opportunity, and that's what it ended up being, when they attacked us, uh, presented itself, we felt like that was our chance to put down a good, strong demonstration and to let everyone know uh, the whites, the police, the Southsiders, I, I didn't care who it was. Everyone needed to understand that it's about to start getting very ugly for y'all in here. Uh, if y'all attack us one more time, if y'all continue to attack us, uh, we're not going to accept it. And we're going to start making you pay for it dearly. And if I'm not, if if my memory serves me correct, I believe you said after the initial after the initial attack, you guys was put on lockdown for about nine months. Yeah, but no, actually, after the after the second attack, after the first attack, they let us off rather quickly, as if we were not going to respond. You know, uh, after the whites attacked us, and then just like a month and a half or something they let us off and then when we attacked them back so now it's been two riots then we went on lockdown uh for about nine months and it was another attack then we went on lockdown for two years right okay and so that's what i wanted to that's what i want to speak about a little bit explain for the people out there who've never been in prison what's it like being confined in a small concrete you know, a, a small concrete, it's, I won't even say bathroom because the cells aren't as big as a bathroom. A small concrete, a small concrete cage, I guess is the best word that I can come up with for two years. Now, for the people that's never been to prison, understand that we're not leaving these cells. We're in these cells with the exception of uh, they're letting us shower possibly every three days. Food is being brought to our cells. Unless we're going on a medical ducket or being called back to court or something like that, we are in these cells 24 hours a day, seven days a week. What's it like, man, living like that? And now, now that you're free, you know, you're out here, you're doing things, man, and you look back on stuff like that. How does that, how does that make you feel that you was able to survive something like that and you had to deal with something like that? Well, I mean, living in the cage is horrible, you know, uh, because, it, 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 you know, yeah, essentially it's just dehumanizing uh, because uh, you have no rights. You've been stripped of all of your rights, all of your freedoms, and, uh, and you don't even have basic freedoms. And, of course, you need, want, and miss your family. And uh, it is a form of torture being in that situation, and it has broken many men. Uh, having to sit inside of a of a cage, a hell cell, for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in, in many instances, and it would be hard without strength of mind to surmount that. Uh, you have to have faith in yourself and believe in yourself and believe that you are better than, than this, and that you will one day get an opportunity 
to exhibit that. And I, of course, eventually got my opportunity last year, April 19th, 2022, uh, when I was paroled. I had 20 years at first on the robbery, but then in 2019, I went back to court and was able to get 10 years knocked off my sentence. And that's how I got home last year. I was supposed to still be in there to at least 2030 or 2031. Wow. So I'm not even supposed to be home right now. And, or well, I am supposed to be home. I'm, I'm here. I'm supposed to be here. It's a blessing that I'm here. And I'm supposed to be here because I'm not supposed to be uh, incarcerated. I'm a prison abolitionist. I don't believe that uh, only a few people really in the world uh, should be incarcerated. People, these people who are really irredeemable. But uh, most people are redeemable. And, uh, and I just feel like America's just not in a position uh, to point its finger uh, at anyone uh, without forgiveness, considering that uh, my people have forgiven them. Most definitely, right? And you, and you pointed out something, like I said, and sometimes I think that due to the fact that I did a lot of prison time, a person may say something and it may go over a lot of people's heads, but I, I view things differently. You said in prison, um, you don't have no rights. And I don't think people don't understand the deepness of that statement, you know, because in prison, we're allowed to have a TV. Um, we're supposed to get phone calls if, if we're if it's normal program. We're allowed to get a shower every day. We're allowed to go to um, go to exercise if, if it's a normal program. But actually, we don't have none of those rights, because if if the police decides to come in your cell and take your TV, like you said, we don't have no rights because what you going to do? Either you're going to stab the police, go beat the police up, and you're going to go get put in another cage, and situation is going to be worse. The police is definitely going to come back and assault you once they handcuff you and run over there with 15, 20 deep. So if you think about it, man, just the the the, the deepness of your statement, you we have no rights whatsoever in prison. What are you going to do? And then any recourse that you do have through some type of legal process may take two, three years, you know, uh, uh, five, six months to write and say, hey, the, the police took my TV. So I just think people need to really, really think, man, before they put themselves in a situation. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's really not something that you can try to convey to someone. That's, someone, that's something that someone would have to live in order to really grasp uh, the detriment it causes to one's psyche. But I wouldn't encourage anyone to go and find out for themselves. And my whole message and my whole channel is uh, geared towards trying to steer the youth away from making the same mistakes that I made. Because, uh, again, it makes no sense to me that I would have to go do all of that time and that my brethren would then turn around and have to do the same time that I did. That It has to stop somewhere. That means that I'm doing something wrong. Uh, I haven't learned something, and if I have learned it, I'm not sharing that message with my people if they have to turn around and go through the same things that I went through. Most definitely. And <clears throat> one quick question I want to ask you, what is the most, um, when you was in prison, what is the, if not the most, what is one of the more horrific things that you've seen um, in terms of violence that will always stay imprinted in your mind? Well, uh, I saw many, obviously, uh, particularly there in high desert, with it being so violent. But the one would just be, I guess, probably the story that I just told, actually, the video that I just put out just yesterday on my channel. And they would have to go subscribe to check it out. But it's uh, the unaliving of Southsider Flacco uh, there in Corcoran Sioux. And uh, he was unalived by another Southsider who was a white boy. He was a white dude, but he was running Southside. And uh, the way it all went down uh, it's a, was a little eerie, and sometimes uh, it haunts me. And so you guys heard it, man. In order to check that story out, go subscribe to his page, Damian Porter, Prison Chronicles. That's D-A-M-I-O-N. P O R T E R Prison Chronicles, man. Um, hopefully, 
You guys will enjoy this interview and want him back. Hopefully, he'll maybe come back and bless my channel with his presence again. And anything you want to say before you uh before we head out of here, Damien? Well, just want to thank you, uh, Chill, for having me on. I appreciate you, brother. And uh, you're very uh, intelligent as well. And keep doing what you're doing, uh, uh, trying to help uh, shed light on what happens behind those walls. And hopefully uh, they your message reaches the right ears and it steers people away from the dreadfulness uh, that is incarceration. And uh, I'll just piggyback off of what you said and reiterate what you said. And that's ask the people to uh, subscribe to my channel at Damien Porter Prison Chronicles. And I appreciate you, brother. All right. Once again, you guys, just don't go and watch. Go and subscribe, man. Help the brother. Uh, help his channel grow. Help him spread the message. Check him out once again. Damien Porter Prison Chronicles, man, on YouTube. And one last question I want to ask you too before I go. I've been thinking: Was you was you robbing establishments or was you robbing people? Uh, people. Because I want to say, as big as you is, man, <laughs> how did you think you was gonna rob somebody and they not remember his business? <laughs> yeah, well, one time I did get arrested for a robbery that I didn't do. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, of course, it, it'd be hard to get away with my size. Yeah. Right. Hey, so, you know, like I said, once again, check him out, man. He has a lot to share, a lot of information. Uh, his channel is extremely, extremely good. I watch it myself. Uh, thank you for showing up, man. And hopefully, you know, I can interview you again someday. Absolutely. Thank you, brother. All Appreciate right. You have, a, you have a good day. You too. Thank you, brother.